This is a recording of Mr. D.P. Davis, former Chief Test Pilot of the Air Registration Board, recorded on the 27th of July, 1992. Uh, can I ask you when you were born? Uh, in April 1920. Did you come from an aviation background? No. Uh, uh, can I expand on that? Yes, sure. A lot of people imagine that I was one of these small boys who lived and dreamt aeroplanes and made models and chucked them around. Uh, that is so far from the truth. I had no interest in flying aeroplanes until early in the war when I went to sea in the Royal Navy as a torpedo rating and I got sunk. I was with two or three other people, one of whom was Godfrey Phillips, the son of the Markovich cigarette people. He had been slung out of the Fleet Arrow for having been found in the Wren's quarters every night for a week. And the captain, at whatever station he was, threatened him that if he was caught there again, he would be chucked out of the Fleet Arrow and would go back into general service. Exactly that happened the following night. So Godfrey Phillips was thrown out of the Fleet Arrow and came back into general service. And he and I, and a lot of other people, were posted to HMS Patia, which was an armed merchant cruiser. And one grisly night in May, April 1941, we sailed from South Shields, and nine hours later, we were sunk. And I spent the whole night, literally, swimming around in the North Sea. I was picked up the next morning, came ashore, went back to barracks, Chatham Barracks, Godfrey Phillips, unfortunately, was killed in that disaster, but he had told me that I and other people like me were fools to go sweating around on the lower deck in the Royal Navy when we could live the life of a king in the fleet arm as a pilot. So having got thoroughly wet and fed up on one occasion, I thought there must be a cushier way of fighting this war than flogging around in the Royal Navy. So I applied for a commission, I applied for the Fleet Air Arm, and they accepted me. And I went into flying simply to find a nicer way of fighting a war. Where did you uh, join to do your initial flying training? I, I was sent down to um, Leon Solent initially, and then Gosport. And I did my early training with a lot of direct entry straight from school. That was ground training. After that, I started flying training at Birmingham at Elmden Airport on Tiger Moths. And then you went on advanced training on what, Harvard's? Harvard's at Kingston in Ontario, then back to the UK, and this part of the world actually, I went to Castle Coombe on Masters, Albacores and Swordfish. Is that where the motor racing track is now? Yes. It was then a satellite of Halamington. Uh, so I did some more training there, then I went up to Crail in Scotland for torpedo training, and then Arbroath for deck landing training, and at the end of that I was fully qualified. Can you explain in a little detail what form deck landing training took in those days? Yes. There was a concrete deck which was a marked out part of a runway at Arbroath. And it had three or four arrestor wires stretched across it. And then there was a batsman who guided us into these very slow speed landings. And he could control us in Azimuth on the glide path and indeed in terms of speed. If he could see too much tail hanging down, he knew you were too slow and so on. So he used to guide us in and we used to make initially touch and go landings when the wires were flat on the deck. And then after a bit, we would put the hook down and we would land and pick up a wire. And was this like, you trained on swordfishes then, did you? Or? Well, I actually did mine on albacores, uh -huh. which was like a GT swordfish, you know. It was covered in. It was quite warm and comfy. Well, a swordfish was a pain. And then, <laughs> then how, many, how many hours did you do on, on the concrete carrier before you went to sea? Oh, we did about 12 landings, that's all. Mm -hmm. And then there was a little carrier. Isn't it strange? I think it was the activity. We used to call them banana boats because they were pre-war banana boats which had had the uh, superstructure taken off and a flat deck put on them. 
and we did our qualifying landings on the activity by day. Later, of course, I joined my first squadron and went to Unicorn, did a lot more deck landings by day and night. In fact, when I think of some of the things I did, I'm jolly glad nobody would ask me to do them now, because I'm sure I would flatly refuse. Deck landing at night is the hairiest thing you can imagine. However, I'm getting ahead of no, myself. No, it's, it's, it's fine. Um, going on to your deck landings, I mean, did you find it particularly daunting, your, your first real deck landing? No, I didn't. The, fortunately, the weather was calm. You mean on the, on the real deck? On, yeah, a, on the real deck, yeah. yes. Yeah. No, it was calm, and other, some of the other chaps had done it before me, and, and in my view, they couldn't fly as well as I did, so I thought, well, if they can do it, I can do it. So I did. And uh, it worked out quite well. The time that I was bothered, later on we used to do Gibraltar convoys. And I can remember coming back to the Unicorn early on a grisly Bay of Biscay morning, because I we'd, we'd been shot off early, uh, er, very early in the morning when it was still dark, to do an anti-submarine patrol, you see. So you come back after about three hours at 2,000 feet, and you look down, and there was Unicorn, and from 2,000 feet, it was tiny. Well, I was used to that feeling, because when you get down there, it gets bigger and bigger as you get closer, and when you're actually landing on, it looks a reasonable size. But it was a hell of a rough day, and the ship was pitching and rolling all over the place. And for the first time ever, I wondered if I would get on. And I knew I'd had to get on, because Spain was neutral, and Portugal was neutral. We couldn't go ashore if we ran out of courage. We simply had to get on. Well, in the event, I was jolly lucky, because as I came over the round down, having worked like mad to get the swordfish down that low, the ship came up to meet me, and I simply closed the throttle, caught the first wire, and it was one of the best landings I ever did. But it was all joss, you see. It, I was just lucky that the ship pitched up mm -hmm. and met me as I came over the round down. Had it been going down, I would have finished up in the barrier. Were the swordfishes... Uh equipped with sort of um, extensive oleos to catch an impact like that, as the modern aircraft are? N well, they were, they were clearly designed for deck landing. They had a lot of compliance in the gear. It didn't give like a modern gear does, which is to go like that. It sort of went like that. It squashed outwards. But, um, and of course it didn't weigh much. In fact, that was one of the problems. The damn thing wouldn't stop flying. It it was much harder to land a swordfish than an Avenger. And it was much harder to land an Avenger than I imagine it is to land a modern high-speed Navy, um, American Navy fighter. Because these days, you see, they just drive them on and smash them onto the deck. They, they damn nigh literally smash them onto the deck. The hook catches a wire and they stop. To some extent, you could do that with an adventure. You, you could run it in, put it down, and it would pick up a wire and stop. But with the swordfish, you had to be within a few knots. And when I say a few, I mean two or three knots of the correct speed. If you were too slow, it fell out of the sky early. And I've seen people fall in the water astern of the carrier because they got too slow. I saw another guy hit the round down hard, but he had just enough speed to sort of clamber onto the ship. But if you were too fast, it wouldn't land. Had you in that manoeuvre got very close to the deck, you didn't know whether you caught a wire or not. And of course, if you catch a wire and attempt to go around, the wire will stop you. It, it doesn't muck about. You can't pull the hook out of a swordfish. If you catch a wire and attempt to make a go around, one second later, it'll stop you stone dead and it'll pull you straight onto the deck, and of course the gear collapses, and, and you've really made a hornix of it then. In fact, my only deck landing accident in three years of carrier flying was a night landing on a swordfish on Unicorn in the Irish Sea on a pitch black night, and it was blowing half a gale. It was very, uh, it was a hairy night. I made a reasonable approach. I got very close to the deck. I closed the throttle. When the batsman said cut, I closed the throttle. Now, for a moment, the aeroplane simply floated. It didn't come down, it didn't go up, it just floated. And I thought, crikey, 
if I don't do something, um, I'm going to make a mess of this. So I pull the stick back, a whisker, in order to drive the tail down so that the hook will catch a wire. But instead of the tail going down, the, the aeroplane climbed a few feet. I knew then, at least I suspected I hadn't caught a wire, but I wasn't sure. So, in order not to make a bigger mess of it that, than I clearly was going to make, I simply left it alone. And the machine, it hadn't caught a wire. It drifted slowly into the barrier. The gear, the main wheels, stuck in the barrier. Of course, the, the barrier was up. The engine was still running, and I still had elevator control because the wind across the deck was so strong. And I felt a proper chicken sitting there with, with my aeroplane stuck in the barrier, and I could still fly it. And, of course, Commander Flying could see what was going on, and he shouted, lower the barrier. As they lowered the barrier, unfortunately, the machine tipped forward a little bit, and the propeller hit the deck and stopped the engine. It was a three-bladed metal prop, and the, the end six inches of each blade was tipped back. But it wasn't much of a problem. That was my only uh, deck landing. What, what was the normal approach speed on a swordfish, then? It was about 58 knots. Which is, well, can you imagine? Yeah. 50. So the carrier would be doing about 25 flat out, would it? It depended on, on the and wind then you speed. Just, you just needed a wind speed of about 30 knots. Yes, you did. Yeah. And if there were 30 knots of wind, the ship would only do two or three knots, just enough to keep it the steerage mm. way. Mm. If, on the other hand, there was no wind, they'd have to whack it up. And, of course, Unicorn was only good for about 24 knots, whereas Illustrious was good for 31 did, did you get a lot of dirty wind around the island often on when you were no, coming in? No, because the captain used to keep the wind fine on the port bow, and there was a steam jet right up forward, so that he could always tell precisely where the wind was. They used to keep the wind about 8 or 9 degrees on the port bow, so that the disturbed air from the superstructure would go off on the starboard quarter, and we made our approaches around the port quarter and then onto the flight deck. Tell me a bit about night operations. I mean, you, 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 you had illuminated bats, didn't you? Yes. Any other lighting to give you... Um... The, there was a blue light on the top of the masthead of the ship. And, of course, the ship had a beacon, a radio homing beam. But it was pretty weedy. You had to get quite close to the ship before you could use it. And then you came up to the ship and you saw this weedy little blue light pointing straight up in the air and then you knew that was the carrier you knew what the wind was you you deduced the course it was steering and then you did a circuit and you came down and you and you could see you see when you'd been flying for hours your night vision was remarkable particularly in a swordfish because a swordfish didn't have any night lighting by proper lights the instruments had that stuff you used to have on watches, um, fluorescent stuff. Fluorescent yes. yes. And here were the UV lamps. And when you switched them on, these instruments glowed. Mind you, it was still damn pitch black in there. But after you'd been flying for three hours, it was quite amazing what you could see. And eventually, you could see the carrier even on a pitch black night. And you flew alongside, you flew over it, you did a square circuit, and then you came in. And as you turned on to, the final approach, you picked up the batsman, and he had a one big light on his chest and one in each bat so that you could see what he was doing. And you just came steaming in. Oh, I think there were a few dim reds on the round arm, which you, you know, the, the round arm, the aft end of the deck, which you had to keep above, of course. But you didn't have a full set of runway lights and vases and things oh, like cranky, that? Oh, cranky, no. <laughs> not, not in any way. No. What about radio? Oh, no, we, we had no radio. Not in swordfish. Nothing. So, I mean, if, if a carrier had to recover a squadron... Yes. How has it all worked out? Do you mean in training or after well, a strike? I, either. I mean, supposing you were coming back from a night, night exercise, and perhaps six of you... Well, you, you, would, you, you would virtually be to get... Well, you, you see, if it was training in peacetime, no, I, I mean, in a non-operational area, you'd have your own nav lights on, on the aeroplane, and so would everybody else. And then as you came over the ship, whoever got there first landed on, the next guy landed on. If you came back as a squadron of 12, you went off into, I've forgotten what it was called, but it was, oh no, I do remember, Etchel and Starboard. Mm -hmm. 
and then the first guy peeled off and went round and landed, and then the second and third and fourth and so on. And, and it, it worked out. But I mean, in, in the situation you mentioned on your convoy to Gibraltar... Yes. Um, they were all single patrols. Uh -huh. The ship only fielded one aeroplane at a time. Mm -hmm. well, and what about navigation? I mean, you mentioned this beacon, but um, presumably you soon got out of range of this beacon. Oh, yeah. Well, we all carried... Um, we called them observers. The RAF would have called them navigators. And they were very specialist navigators. It was pure DR. Mm -hmm. And we had some very demanding exercises to do. Now, the exact names escape me. But, for example, one would be a moving line ahead search. The fleet and the convoy, let us assume, is doing 18 knots, knots on north. You are required to go 50 miles ahead and at 2,000 feet at 50 miles, you're out of sight of the fleet. You then, your navigator then has to plot a course which takes you 25 miles each side, and every time you cross the extended center line of the fleet, you should be the equivalent of 18 knots further north, you see, every hour. Mm -hmm. So it was a very demanding exercise, and we rested our confidence in them totally, because we couldn't navigate, we were busy flying the aeroplane and looking for German U-boats. So these young men, and they were as young as we were, we were all 20 or 21, and I felt a bit sorry for them because they had to hold this huge plotting board on their lap. Open cockpit. Open cockpit, yes. They had um, a light for night flying, you see, where they could shade it and work on it. And uh, you, t and you see, the, a swordfish, it had a directional gyro, but it was a dreadful thing. It, it had enormous precession. It used to wander off all over the place. And we used to fly on these big P7 compasses. And you had to know all about acceleration errors, turning errors, and all that old-fashioned stuff. But mostly it worked. Mostly it worked, and we got back. What was the range of the ship's beacon, then? If, um... Oh, about four or five miles. Ah. And, of course, in ordinary circumstances, it wasn't switched on anyway, because it was suspected, maybe, that a German U-boat could take a sight on it, I don't know. Or a condor or something. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Extraordinary. Yeah. You, you uh, mentioned earlier on that um, the Swordfish was a, uh, not the most comfortable aeroplane to sit in. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you sort of uh, uh, go into a bit more detail of flying an open cockpit job on a winter night? Well, well... Did you have heating... You must have had heated flying suits, for instance. No, we didn't. No? We didn't. No, I'd, you see, the very worst was... During my training, we were night flying at Macrahanish in Scotland. And in the winter, it was paralyzing anyway up there. And then we had to go out and do three or four hours night flying in a swordfish. We had what was clearly capable flying clothing. You dressed in your ordinary clothes. You then wound a scarf very carefully around your neck, fairly tightly too. Then you put on this Sidcot flying suit. You know that old-fashioned Sidcot mm. that you, like, uh, I'm sure Orville Wright and, and the other guys used to wear them? I it, wore a version of it when I had a motorbike. <laughs> oh, yes, and it had huge collars and things. Mm. Um, but it was essential that you wound the scarf around your neck very carefully, did the Sidcot up tight, and got the whole thing thoroughly well organized like this, you see. Because if you left a tiny hole, if, for example, the zip didn't make the last notch, which is only, what, a tenth of an inch, mm -hmm. the wind would find that hole, and it would go in there, and you would get absolutely frozen stiff. We had three pairs of gloves, a silk pair, a woolen pair, and then the silk suit would come down there, and then a huge leather gauntlet, which came up to here. And equally... Whacking great flying boots, a helmet, goggles, and a gospel speaking tube. See, there was no radio, there was no, there was no nothing. There was no electrical intercom? No, none at all. You had to blow down this thing, and of course you blew all the dust into your observer's ears in the back. <laughs> uh, we didn't quite have a steam whistle. You know on steam trawlers years ago, you used to blow, and the whistle would blow in the engine room, and the engineer would go. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, that, it, was, door, yeah. it was something like that. You see, even at a, a very young age, and I was interested in aeroplanes when I was very young, and I was, what, when the war started, I was eight, so um, I was, you know, quite air-minded in that sense. Even at that age, it occurred to me that the types of aircraft that the, the Navy had compared to the types that the RAF had, I mean, they were, they were a generation apart. 
Oh, they were. I mean, I know you, you had, um, there was the Blackburn Skewer. Hmm. Uh, that, that was a dive bomber, but it was also a torpedo, wasn't it? Uh, no, it no, it, it wouldn't carry a torpedo. The skewer the was skewer. a dive bomber. It was a dive bomber. And then there was a, its mate, which was similar, was the rock. The rock. Which had a turret at the back. Like a Defiant. Hmm. Yeah. Yes, um, exactly. But they were the modern ones, and of course the Fulmer was quite modern, but that didn't come in until later, did it? No, it didn't, and that uh, had very little performance. I mean, was this uh, a sort of political battle in Whitehall, that the RAF got all the money and the Navy didn't? No. You see, having done my time on Swordfish and Albacores, and since then, on a lot of... A, Still early aeroplanes, like the dreaded Barracuda and the Firebrand 5, it is my view that the chaps in MOD, or whatever they were then called, who wrote the spec for Navy aeroplanes, made a proper cock of it. They asked the aeroplane to do much too much. You, and the biggest example was the Barracuda 1. Do you, are you familiar with the Barracuda? I remember the Barracuda, yes. It was the world's biggest heap it weighed God knows what. It had the same engine as a spit. And everybody knows the performance of a Spitfire. They hung so much junk on the Barracuda that it would hardly go at all. And I can give you one classic example. When you came in for a landing, you put the gear down, and it came down like half of the fourth bridge. These enormous girders mm. came out of mm. the body mm. and went down. And then they had huge flaps and you put the flap down, and then you had to open the throttle like mad to keep your airspeed, and then you, you made this approach. If, at the last moment, you didn't like what you were doing, and you wanted to make a go-round, do you know it literally wouldn't climb away at full power? You, you open the throttle to full power, and this faithful little Merlin would give you, whatever, 1,250 horsepower, but the machine would continue to go down you had to pull the flaps up immediately. And then that allowed it to sort of fly level. And then you pull the gear up and it would climb away. How did it ever go into production? Well, some bunch of guys must have said, well, OK, it's close enough to the spec, we'll have it. But you see, worse than that, I believe the Barracuda was out in the Indian Ocean in the middle of the war, like maybe 43, and it was being escorted by American... They weren't even Hellcats and Corsairs in those days. They were Wildcats and whatever. And the Americans refused to do any more operations because the Barracuda was so slow in the climb and in the cruise that they couldn't keep slow enough to protect it. They were all stalling out. But we were talking about Navy aeroplanes. Navy aeroplanes. Ah, yeah. the Barracuda was a disaster. Mm -hmm. And the Firebrand, which was um, a bruff aeroplane, that was post-war, wasn't it? Yes, it was. I did a lot of work on the Firebrand. Um, it had the same engine as the Sea Fury, a big Centaurus. And, we, the, and in effect, there was the same comparison, you see. There was the Barracuda and the Spit, and then there was the Firebrand and the Sea Fury. The Sea Fury went like the clappers. It was a sweet aeroplane. But the Firebrand used to bumble along with hardly any performance at all. And it was enormous. It was 19 feet from the pilot's eye to the top of the cowling. And landing that, ah, uh, it was awful. You couldn't see anything at all. You had to do a side-slipping approach onto the ground. I didn't deck land the fire, right? thank goodness. Mm. Can, can we move on now to the Avenger, uh, um, to contrast it with the Swordfish, and how, how you found that? Oh, I loved the Avenger. You see... When I was on Swordfish, a lot of my friends were on sea fires, and I envied them, because a sea fire was a real airframe. The gear went up and down, and it had flaps, and it, it had all sorts of things. It had a radio, whereas my poor old Swordfish had nothing at all. And just one little, one little uh, incident. I was at Bally Halbert in Northern Ireland, and I was asked to take the chief engineer of the Unicorn over to Liverpool for a meeting one day, so I did. I flew him over. Landed him at speed. I had to go up to the control tower to report in this huge flying suit. And in those days, I had a big beard. And when I booked in, the air traffic control officer looked at me and he said, Oh, he said, Orville Wright, I assume. <laughs> <laughs> I was furious. So, when I got onto the Avenger, which was at Boston in America, 
Squantum Naval Air Base. I loved it. It was a fully set up modern aeroplane. The gear went up and down, it had flaps. Uh, it was as strong as hell. It was reasonably fast for a big fat torpedo bomber. It was great and it was warm and comfortable. The American versions had an autopilot but the British Navy took it out. It didn't, it didn't want an autopilot. Can you imagine an autopilot on a single engine aeroplane? But it was a great aeroplane. And it, it, you were saying earlier about the swordfish wanting to go on flying. I mean, when you told the Avenger something, it, it, it obeyed did it. it. Yes, you it did. You knew exactly where you were with it. Yes, it did. It, and it, you had a very good view for deck landing. You could actually come in straight and you could see the batsman all the way in. So you just kept coming. And it was very precise, very precise and easy to fly. And you simply drove it onto the deck. And of course, typical of the American Navy constructors, the gear was strong enough. Um, in fact, I must have watched hundreds of deck landings. I, I've never seen a, an Avenger collapse its gear. Never. They're very, very strong. An interesting thing about the Avenger, because I, I finished up my national service doing five years in the RNVR ah. uh, as a rating. I, I, was, I was in the Royal Signals for my full time on, on um, radio and radar, and then I just transferred. Uh, which I enjoyed it more. I had enough of Salisbury Plain. I wanted to, I wanted to go to, to see. And on one year, coronation year, 53, in fact, our sea training involved going over to the States in a, an old maintenance carrier called the Perseus. Oh, yeah. And picking up Avengers. Yeah. And dropping them off in Glasgow. Yeah. I think, weren't, weren't they a, a safety backup in case the Gannet went wrong or something? I imagine they were. Uh, but they were still there and they were being flown there. And we're not talking about all that long ago, I suppose. No. Not, you know. No. So it, it was obviously a very successful aeroplane. Yes, it was. Yeah. It was. Mm. And it was quite well set up. It had a turret at the back for the air gunner with 2.5s in it, which was a lot of firepower. It had provision for a downward, rearward firing single point five, but the British di didn't fit that. And we had one forward firing gun, which I never found a need for operationally. It was loaded and it was there and all ready. And of course you could carry one thumping great torpedo, four five hundred bombs, or a row of depth charges, or whatever. It was, it was a great aeroplane. Now you, you flew that in Illustrious, did you? Yes, mm. 854 Squadron. So not only was the Avenger a considerable upgrade from the Swordfish, but I would imagine Illustrious was a good upgrade from Unicorn. Well yes it was. See, the Illustrious, uh, it was a very famous carrier. It had done an awful lot of work before we ever joined. But then it did the whole of the Far East operation all the way down through Panambang and Medan and down through Sumatra and then round Australia and then up in it became part of the American Pacific Fleet part of the British Pacific Fleet and we did all the ops off Japan and Formosa before we came back and it had a steel deck oh yes instead of the wooden it, deck of the it, American yes it did you weren't involved in any major sea battle like Coral Sea or anything like no. that? no no but off Japan, we were attacked umpteen times by kamikazes, and I have Fletcher, my navigator, took them um, photographs of illustrious being straddled by a kamikaze on the port side and a kamikaze on the starboard side, and great gouts of water. Um, the ship was never hit directly. The superstructure was the, the flight deck wasn't hit, but a kamikaze wouldn't have gone through our flight decks because they they were armoured. Whereas the Americans had uh, wooden flight decks. Things like railway sleepers all loose. When you landed in an American carrier, it rattled, you know, <laughs> like you, when you drive over a bridge, a wooden bridge. And of course, I, the, I forget the names of them, but they had some awful losses up there. Yorktown with, as well. Yes. Yeah. And Bunker Hill was another. Mm -hmm. um, they burned, you see. Yeah. Whereas we had fires on Illustrious from bits of kamikazes, but they were all put out without any trouble. And then the Americans, in their efficient way, built the Essex class, which I gather were superb carriers. Oh. The, the what do you generation. mean with armoured decks? I think they had armoured yeah. decks. I think they learnt from the British carriers on that one. But I learned to my cost, you know, that the main part of Lustrous deck was armoured, but the after round down and the forward round down were just mild steel. And I'll tell you why. We were in Leyte Gulf, on one occasion, refueling and rearming, and I was the squadron admin officer 
and I was in the squadron office right under the rear round down. It was a, we were at anchor, lovely summer's day, a lot of maintenance going on on deck. And I was um, making up, I think I was making up the, rec the, the uh, service records of the troops, you know, to, get, to put them all straight. And while I was working at my desk, there were two enormous bangs and two holes appeared six inches from my right hand. Two holes appeared in the desk. And I looked up and there were two holes in the deck head. And I thought, Christ. So I put my pen down and it was only just a few yards to go up onto the flight deck past those clusters of 0.5 guns we had there. And there was a petty officer armourer there. And there was a Hellcat with the wings folded, which means the wings were like this. And the forward firing guns were pointing downward. And I said, Chief, you bloody nigh kill me. He said, oh, God, he said, I'm sorry about that. I, and I said, what happened? He said, well, one of the armourers got it all wrong. He was fiddling with the guns, and there was a one up the spout of, of these two. And when he tested the firing circuit, they went off. So he and I looked at the deck, and I said, I thought we had an armoured deck. And he said, so did I. Anyway, having heard this bang, Commander E or somebody came down and said, what's all this? You know, guns going off and so on. So we complained to him, you see, that we thought that the whole deck was armoured all the way. And he said, oh no, the after round and the forward round are not armoured. And a point five, letting go at three feet, which is what it was, will go straight through the after round down. And that's what happened. Boy, that was close. Tell me a bit now um, of your psychological feelings and those of your, your mates, if you like, in a war situation, on this carrier, busy operational schedule. Did you enjoy the war, in quotes? Did you, did you suffer from stress at all? No. Um, we, we, I did enjoy the war. Sounds a heinous thing to say now. Well, I but, meant enjoy yes, brackets, yeah. Yes. I didn't suffer stress, I don't think. Did you Look, lose many friends? Yes, we lost a lot, yes. We lost our CEO over Palembang and his number one, six folks. We lost more off Formosa and Japan. But you sort of, you just shrugged your shoulders and you thought, well, I got back and that was it. And if you were scheduled to do another raid the next day, you did it. No one ever, ever dreamt of, of, of chickening out. You just went. In fact, looking back on it, we were either very young or very stupid. When you think back on, on what you were asked to do and you went and did it, ah, I wonder sometimes now. Even the non-operation flying we did, four hours of anti-submarine anti searching in swordfish in the Bay of Biscay on one engine. And yet that was a Peggy 30. It never coughed, you know. It, it just kept running the whole time. But no, um, I was not aware of any stress at any time. And yet I did two long tours. I did one in 818, Swordfish, and one in 854. What was the accident rate like on these carriers? Oh, God. Appalling. The, the, the Royal Navy's biggest loss in aeroplanes was in training and deck landing. The second biggest loss was in deck landing in operational fly. You see, I was at Salerno on the Unicorn. We were not flying Swordfish. We were flying Seafires. And the Seafire, it is well known, was a very good Navy fighter, but it was a dreadful deck landing aeroplane. It was a dreadful deck landing aeroplane. It was fast onto the deck because it wasn't designed as a deck landing aeroplane. Um, the view ha ahead was appalling because it had this huge Merlin sticking out in front. And uh, the gear was entirely wrong. Now, if you remember when a spit sits on the ground, the legs stick down like that, quite forward. Now, when an RAF chap lands a Spitfire on a, on a runway or a grass field, the gear is set to take the shock in the correct line, which is straight up the legs. When you deck land a Seafire, unless you get it dead on, which means that you put the wheels on the ground the moment the hook catches, if, you, if the wheels are still off but the hook catches, see, because the hook hangs down, it slows you down very rapidly, and then the aeroplane falls onto the carrier and as it does the gear collapses forward and if i've seen one of those i must have seen dozens and dozens at salerno at the end of the three-day operation which was unicorn and four smaller carriers there was barely a seafire left serviceable they'd been pranked 
they used to spin in on final approach because there's no wind off Salona, you see, and these little banana boats, and in fact Unicorn, we couldn't develop enough speed to give these uh, sea fire pilots a decent approach. And I, people used to spin in on final approach. They used to hit the round down. They used to disappear behind the carrier into the water, and unless a destroyer came over and whipped them out quick, they were lost. Or else they smashed it onto the deck, or they missed the wires and hit the barrier. The rate of loss... All over the side? Yes, yeah. The rate of loss was appalling. Mm. It, the, the sea fire should never have gone to sea. That's my view now. They didn't float for very long either when they hit the water, did they? No. no. There was a classic case on Unicorn. We were down off Southern Ireland doing some training because we had sea fire squadrons on there. And the deck landing losses were enormous in training. And there was one guy who had pranged several. Now, Farnborough sent out a young pilot in a sea fire. I wish I knew his name. He was an ace. To show chaps how to deck land sea fires. So this morning, with Unicorn steaming south, this guy showed up. He came around. He did one landing. His wheels straddled the centre line when he stopped. He got about the third wire. It was a perfect landing, and he just sat there with the prop ticking over. So they retracted the hood, the uh, hook, they pushed him back, and he did five more. He did six immaculate landings. Mind you, it was a good day. But even so, I, I've never known a pilot who, could, who would have the courage to say, I'll go and do six perfect landings for you. But he did. And then he pushed off back to Farnborough. So... The, the squadron started flying again, and of course they lost, they sprang one or two aeroplanes. And I happened to be in the island when the CEO of this Sea Fire Squadron got hold of this young man, and he said, now look, whatever his name was, he said, you prang one more, and you're, you, you were posted ashore. Well, of course, under that degree of pressure, I would have hated it. So this poor little chap took off, went around and came in, and boy, did he get it wrong. He bounced in the wires, but he didn't catch a wire. You see, the other thing on a sea fire, the hook was badly damped, and if it touched the ground, it, it would do that, instead of dragging. Now, not thinking that he'd caught a wire, or suspecting that he probably had, he daren't open the throttle. But he hadn't caught a wire, so with the throttle closed, he sailed calmly over the barrier, and landed on the forward deck park, and roped off three more sea fires. So when the CEO said, if you prang one more, you're ashore, he prang four in Make one sure. go. <laughs> <laughs> Can you believe it? Four sea fires written off in one, in five seconds. He survived. There, you see, if it was a gentle prang, you mangled the aeroplane, but, but you came out of it. Oh. <laughs> I mean, I mean, a, a, a sea fire in those days cost about five thousand pounds. Yes, build, they did. It? Yes. I mean, you do that with an F fourteen nowadays, you're in big trouble. Yes, that's right. Um, but that's another story. Yeah. On one occasion, we were doing night shadowing exercises off the Unicorn in the Irish Sea. It was a rough night. There was hell of a wind blowing. After three hours shadowing what I was thought was Unicorn, we came down to identify it and found it wasn't Unicorn at all, it was a tanker. I then realised that after three hours, I was in the middle of the Irish Sea and totally lost, because we'd been following the wrong ship for three hours. I asked my navigator where the nearest point of land was, and he said, the tip of North Wales Peninsula, which sticks out into the Irish Sea. I said, well, give me a course for it, because we haven't got time to muck about. So he told me, whatever, steer 150. So I steered 150. And then, with the aid of this marvellous night vision I told you about, that you develop, and I was flying at 2,000 feet, because I knew there, there was no land on that peninsula above about eight or 900 feet. As I came up to it, I could actually see the cliffs. In spite of the fact that it was virtually a pitch-black night, I could see the cliffs. So I did a gentle turn to the right. And then he said, on the south side of this peninsula is an old RAF airfield, Penross. It was a pre-war bombing and gunnery range airfield. And I said, look, any port in a storm, we'll go there. So I crept round the coast at about a thousand feet, 800 feet, until 
we came to a beach and he said now the airfield is is about a thousand yards behind the beach all i could see were hills and i thought cranky how am i going to get in there so i throttled back and went down to about 200 feet and of course if you fly slowly in a swordfish you can do all sorts of things with it it wouldn't be wrong to say you'd have another job to kill yourself in a swordfish unless you dove it straight into the ground so I did one run in for about two or three hundred yards and it was all black ahead of me. I literally didn't know if there was a hill there or not. And then I turned around and came out again. And then I went in again. And as I went in again, I saw the headlights of a motor car shining. So I went out again. And then I hung about out here. And then there were a number of motor cars shining their headlight beams across the field. And of course they knew they knew I was in trouble and had to land. So so that's what they did. So I then saw the direction they were pointing in. I did, did a little DR uh, circuit round the place and came sailing down, closed the throttle, descended the aeroplane, and as I looked left and right, I this was sheer joss again. I was correctly lined up for landing and I was lower than the hangers on each side of me. There was one hanger there and one hanger there. I hadn't seen them. I just came slipping in between them and I put the machine on the ground. It stopped, we turned around and taxied back and I shut the engine down and the, a group captain came up and he said, by God, he said, that was good flying. I said, look, I can't tell you how grateful I am that we're all down in one piece. He said, where have you come from? I said, Unicorn, it's out there somewhere. He said, oh, well, you can't go back tonight. He said, come in the mess. So we went in the mess, my navigator and I, and of course my poor old leg, and I had to go to the sergeant's mess, you see. And we had a few drinks. Mind you, I didn't drink much in those days, but we had a few drinks, went to bed. The next morning, I, of course, I wasn't properly dressed, you see. I had a tunic shirt. I didn't have my jacket with me. I must have looked terrible. Went into the mess for breakfast. The groupie came up and he said, we know how to send you back now. He said, we've got a fix for the unicorn at 10 o'clock this morning like halfway between here and the Isle of Man. So at half past nine, we fired up, took off, went back, landed on, and the captain said, well, this guy gave me a letter. He said, give this to your captain. Fanshawe, his name was, he was a good skipper. Um, so I reported to the captain, and Fanshawe was, for, for several other reasons, which I'll tell you about, he was quite fond of me, and he said, oh, Davis, he said, it's nice to see you back. I said, ah, oh, well, it's great to be back, and uh, I gave him this letter. Then an hour later, he sent for me, and he said, you ought to read this. And, of course, this groupie had written up the most glowing account of how I had had um, found the field in the pitch dark, thrown a circuit, alerted them, you know, the whole classical thing. Well, I didn't follow any pattern. I just wanted to save my silly neck. But it all worked well. And if you, well, if you remember... If you did anything good in those days, you got what they called a green endorsement in your logbook. Your, your station commander or the captain wrote in the logbook, good show chaps, with a little description. So I got a green endorsement for that. But the other two, which were more interesting really, having done some of these searches, anti-submarine searches, come back to where the fleet was supposed to be, and of course, no fleet. Now, the fleet was in the right place. We were in the wrong place. Not having much fuel left, you have to start a square search, which is an academically correct way of exploring an area where you think your home is before you finally run out of fuel. So we didn't muck about. We instantly started a square search. And on the second northbound leg, not seeing a thing, my air gunner said, I think there's something way over there on the starboard beam. Well, it was the only hope we had, so I turned towards it. And, of course, within two minutes, it was the port wing destroyer of the fleet. So we flew across him, flew across some of the cruisers, and there was dear old Unicorn steaming north, and we turned and we landed on. On the next occasion, we got lost. Circumstances were slightly different. There was a very strong wind from the north. The convoy was steering north. And we were doing, or had been doing, a moving line astern search. So that when we got back to where we thought the convoy should be, and it wasn't, 
I immediately guessed that we'd been blown miles downwind and that our best hope of salvation was to steer north. So we did. We steered north. We were flying at 100 knots. The wind was all of 50. I got very experienced at estimating wind speed by the state of the sea. And so we were only making about 20, 50 knots over the sea. Now, the fleet was doing um, the best part of 20 knots north. So in effect, we were overhauling the fleet only at a closing rate of 30 knots. And my guess is that we were a long way astern, maybe 60 or 70 miles, which would have meant two hours flying. I didn't have two hours fuel. I had about half an hour or 20 minutes. Well, there's nothing more we could do but hang on and stay north at 2,000 feet. The fuel was running away, and the swordfish had a little collector tank on the top wing so that all the fuel in the wings used to go into the collector tank and then when you were getting very low, you could see the level coming down on the sight glass. Well, this level started to come down, and I knew then that I had about five gallons, which was enough for about ten minutes, maximum. And I thought, oh, well, so be it. As I looked and got, began to get a bit concerned, but even then not terribly concerned, I saw a unicorn with one destroyer coming south at high speed, and I knew that the captain, this dear old chap Fanshawe, had guessed my problem and had turned round to help me. And he came south and I was steering north and they turned the ship directly underneath me and all I had to do was close the throttle and come down and come down and land it on. And when I landed on, I had about two inches of fuel, which was maybe two gallons. It was nothing. I can't claim the engine stopped. It was still running, and I pulled the slow running cut out, and it stopped, and I got out. And I thought, great, you know, back on board again. And I went up to see the captain, because one did, I was only a sub lieutenant, one didn't ordinarily go and see the captain. But um, I was so pleased, and I went up, and I said, can I see the captain? And the navigating officer said, yes, he's on the bridge. So I went in, and I said, I just want to say thank you very much. One thing about Vian. Would you like to hear, my, because I met him later in the war, he didn't remember, but I remembered. On one of the trips to Malta, although I was a pilot, I was required to do officer of the watch in harbour. And on the occasion we got into Malta, when I was looking forward to a beer with the rest of the chaps, I got stung for officer of the watch. So I had to, I had to go and be officer of the watch for about four hours from midday, the afternoon watch. And... Um, I thought, well, okay then, so be it. To my horror, at two o'clock, everybody started rushing around, and I said, what's going on? And they said, the Admiral's coming aboard, via. So, we all got lined up, we had the bosun with his pipe, we had the master at arms, and me. Vian came up the gangway, we, everybody blew their whistles and saluted. He looked at me, and he nearly went mad. He said, who are you? I said, I'm the officer of the watch, sir. He said, you're improperly dressed. He said, what the devil are you doing on this ship in sandals and short white socks? We were in khakis, you see. He said you were supposed to have brown shoes and long brown stocking. And he was really going from me. And then his um, flag lieutenant waggled his arm and said, look, come on, you know, we're late. So, so he broke, and he said, I'll see you later. But fortunately he didn't. <laughs> he went up. And when I, and when the master of arms looked at me, he said, I can't get over you bloody pilots. He said, fancy turning up for officer watch dressed like that. He said, you were lucky you weren't shot then. Well, that was that. That was just finished that. But years ago, years after that, out in the Far East, I had to fly Vian from China Bay onto the Illustrious. And I think the CEO asked me to do it because I was a good deck landing pilot, you see. I, I never had a prang deck landing an adventure. And Vian turned up, and I felt like saying, do you remember me, that horribly dressed chap who was off to the watch at Malta? But I didn't say that. And there was Vian in this immaculate white uniform. And I had a different navigator for that day, an Irishman called Cyril Keane. And, of course, everybody who flew in the Avenger had to wear a May West. Keane deliberately picked up a wet, mucky May West, instead of a clean, decent one, he picked up a filthy one which somebody had dropped in the mud. 
Vian turned round, and I said to Keane, you know, sorry, I tried to say, don't put that one on, give him a clean one. But he didn't. Cyril Keane wrapped this filthy May West around him, and I thought, oh, well, strapped him in. We went over to Illustrious, made a good landing. Vian got out, and he thanked me for a good flight and a good landing. And he took this May West off, and as he walked up the flight deck, he was in the biggest mess you ever saw. There was all brown mud down the back of him. But he he must have le learned later, but he didn't say anything to me about it. So those were my two little brushes with Vian. When I came back from the Far East, I really didn't know what to do. But I knew only that I want to, wanted to continue flying in some way. And when I left the ship and went back to Leon Solent, I read an Admiralty Fleet order which offered pilots what was called the Navy Maintenance Test Pilots Course at Worthy Down. And it sounded the sort of attractive thing I would like to do. So I went to Worthy Down for a month and did the Navy Test Pilots Course. Now, this wasn't experimental test flying. It was the routine testing of production aeroplanes, new aeroplanes out of the factory, and aeroplanes which had been serviced and overhauled. It was run by a chap called Leslie Castlemaine, who was a friend of all the pre-war test pilots, Philip Lucas, Bill Humble, and that lot. He was one of that mob, and he was a great egg. And I flew all sorts of aeroplanes there, Seafires, Hurricanes, Corsairs, Hellcats, Beechcraft Travellers, Stinson Reliance, Wildcats, oh, a whole heap of things. And we learned the essentials of um, routine testing. It, and it was a very good month. It taught me a great deal. It also taught me things not to believe other people too much, because on my first flight in a hurricane, which, in spite of what the chaps who flew doing the Battle of Britain thought about it, I thought wasn't much of an aeroplane. It was nothing like a, a Spitfire. And Castlemaine said, now what you must do is to go up to 6,000 feet and do a stall with the gear down and full flap and the hood open. And being the innocent sort of chap I was, I went up to 6,000 feet, put the gear down, put the flap down, opened the hood, closed the throttle and stalled it. And of course it immediately spun. And a spin with the hood open is an awful experience. It went round and round, it rattled and banged and I thought, Dear God, here we go again. So I pulled the flaps up, because if you get very fast in a spin, you could bust the flaps. I couldn't shut the hood, because I, uh, I was too busy doing other things. But I did the appropriate spin recovery action, and it recovered, you know, like a charm. So I was able to square it off, close the hood, and come home in peace and quiet. But by Joe, that woke me up. Um, they had some American civil aeroplanes, beach travelers, Stinson Reliance, and things like that. And they were the first civil aircraft I'd ever flown. I couldn't get over the fact that they were upholstered inside and they had ashtrays in the armrests of the pilot seat, which I thought was very civilised. Following that, I was posted to Cullum, Cullum, near Oxford, and I did about three months testing on production CFIRs 15 and 17. And I enjoyed that. It was my first productive job as a test pilot, and the Seafire 15 and 17 were the equivalent of the Spitz 14s and 17s and 18s and 19s. They were big, hairy-chested aeroplanes, and they were a joy to fly. Now, in that three months period, I only had two sort of incidents. I was coming back from the firing range on the south coast at one time, and the weather was very, very tooty, and we had no aids to get into column. We used to get in by coming up to Swindon, flying along the GWR railway line, and then turning left at Didcot, I think, or wherever. And then that would take us to the field. Well, one day, the weather was very bad, and I throttled right back, and I had a bit of flap on even, and I was flying at about 120 knots, and I couldn't find Didcot, I couldn't find anything. The next thing I knew, I looked up, and directly ahead of me, at about 70 or 80 yards, was an enormous tower disappearing into the sky, a, 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 a chimney stack, a huge one. I had to do the fastest split ass turn I've ever done in my life, but I did it, and as I went round this tower, 
I was within about 30 feet of it, so close that I could see that the pointing on the brickwork needed redoing. And that's no exaggeration. As I went round, having missed it, the thing is, you see, if you're in a tight spot but you get away with it, the moment the danger has passed, you, you cease worrying about it because it's gone. And as I went round, I looked at the brickwork and I could see that it was all coming to pieces. And I thought, by Joe, they ought to do something about that. And then I went back and landed. The other occasion, which I, I loved, in the testing of these sea fires, we had to prove the armament. We had to fire the guns. They had two thumping great cannons and four point five machine guns. Now, having been a bomber pilot all during the war, I'd never fired a front gun of any capacity. The armourers used to put a few cannon shells in and a few bullets in the machine guns. And we used to go down to Little Hampton and there was a floating target. It was a huge raft. And we used to do a dive on it and fire. And of course you could select, to, to make it last longer, I used to select machine guns, do one run and fire eight rounds or whatever. Then I would do another run and select cannon and let go about four or five shells. And of course the cannon used to go boom, 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 boom. And that was great. Now, later on, I knew I was going to be posted, which I'll come to in a minute. And one day, when I had the last of my sea fires to test, I got hold of the armourer and I said, look, fill up the ammo tanks. He said, oh, I can't do that, sir. We're only allowed like so many shells and so on. I said, look, come on now. I said, There's, nobody actually counts them, do they? And he said, well, no, we don't count them. I said, look, fill it up. Fill up all the cannon and the machine gun belts. He said, oh, all right then. So he did. And of course I had umpteen rounds. I don't know how many, but the airplane was full, full of armament. So I went round down to Littlehampton and I did one run and I was firing the machine guns, you know, for ages and there were still shells available. Then I went round and did another run with the cannon going bump, 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 bump. And I still had rounds available. So I went round again and I selected everything, all the guns and the cannon on. And I did a run on this target from quite high and kept firing. And I was hitting the target all the time because, you see, there's tracer every now and again and you can see where the bullets are going. And they were going straight into this thing. And uh, it, it shows how you can, you can cock it up in no time. I was so fascinated that I got a bit lower than I thought. And I was waiting for the ammo to run out. Well, it ran out at about 100 feet. Good job it did, otherwise I'd have flown straight into the water. Uh, the ammo ran out, and then I pulled up, and I only just missed the target. But I thought, that was the best ten minutes of my life. I flew back to Cullum. It was a passive target, was it? It wasn't, uh, you didn't have people on it or, reporting back? No, no, it was a huge flow. it was about the size of this room. Oh. Enormous. Anyway, I went back. The next evening, the captain Oh, by the way, after that first um, exercise where I nearly hit this tower, except nobody else knew, I got a green endorsement again for having done such good work on production testing, see, which is a bit of rubbish, really. But the next day after this incident about tacking this target, the captain sent for me and he said, Davis, you overdid it yesterday. I said, what? Sir. And he said, you know that target? I said, yes, sir. He said, you sank it. <laughs> and I said, no. He said, yes, you did. He said, mind you, we knew it was old, but he said, you were seen to do three runs with umpteen runs. And I said, yes, I must confess that's exactly what happened. I said, you know I'm being posted. And I'd never fired all these guns before. And he said, well, lucky for you, it was the target was time expired. Except he said, you brought it forward by, by about three months. And he said, Okay then, off you go. So I, I got away with that. But it was a super run. Now you see, by that time, the country, by which I mean the civil people and the Navy and the Air Force, were getting short of test pilots. And another AFO, Admiralty Fleet Order, came out saying, we need pilots for the Empire Test Pilots Corps. And I went for it like a shot. And I had an interview with Willie Wilson. He was the high-speed chap flight in those days, 1940, 1945 and 6. I had a lot of flying hours for a Navy pilot then. I had about 15 or 1800 hours. And I, I'd always had sort of good reports of my flying ability. So they, they took me on. And I was in good company 
Group captain hockey was on the course. Neville Duke, myself, uh, Paddy Barthrop. There were a lot of quite reasonably well-known people now. There were 30 chaps on the course. Took a long time. I was at Cranfield in those days. In, I enjoyed the course enormously. It was the real heart of experimental test flying. And we did a lot of flying. Mosquitoes, Lanx, Lincolns, even Dakotas, Tempest, Meteor 3, Vampire Ones. We flew the lot. It was Hornet as well? As well? No, not then. Okay, later. Mm. And that, it was a great course. And when the results were posted, I was very anxious to see how I had done. And of course, expectedly, Hockey was top because he was a group captain. Neville Duke came second because he was Neville Duke. He was very famous in those days. So we discounted those. The rest of us ordinary chaps, you see, we discounted the first two because they were sort of political ratings, if you know what I mean. And then the next guy was Willie Els, who went to um, Bittiswell later, and then I was next. So although I was fourth, Bill Els and I reckoned that he was top and I was second on the course. And then when we finished that, I got posted to Halamington, which is only just up here. And I had the most marvellous four years as the senior naval officer in the handling squadron. Now, the handling squadron was the squadron in the RAF, which did handling trials on all the new aeroplanes and wrote the pilot's notes for the aircraft in conjunction with the MOD. And that's what we did. And being in that squadron as the only Navy pilot, the other three were all squadron leaders covered with DSOs and DFCs and all the rest. Um, I not only flew all the Navy aeroplanes, I flew all the RAF aeroplanes. And I was one of the few Navy pilots who flew all the current RAF aeroplanes of that time. Not only that, I had a marvellous first day because when I got posted... I reported there, and the CO was Hakim Fryer, Wing Commander Hakim Fryer. Now, he didn't know me, but I knew him because he was my CFI at Kingston, Ontario, umpteen years before. Well, not umpteen, three or four years before. And, of course, when you join a new squadron, see, although I was a Navy pilot, I spent the last five years of my life with the RAF. When you join a new squadron, you've got to give your logbook to the CO. So I gave my logbook to the CEO. He riffled through it and found that I was one of his ex-pupils. And of course, he thought it was fascinating that he taught some guy to fly well enough to survive the war. And he rushed out of his office and he said, Ah, Davis, he said, how marvellous that, you know, you should have come all the way back here and, and work for me again. And I said, that, Oh, that's great, sir, thank you. And he said, Now, come on, he said, Have you flown um, a typhoon? I said, No. He said, well, come on, you're going to fly a typhoon. He said, I'll start it for you. Because he said, it's a sod to start. It's one of these cartridge starters. You can spend hours poking cartridges and it goes poof, but it doesn't catch. Anyway, um, he fired it all up. And it was very complicated. It had a V12. It was a v, was it? The engine was an X. It was a vulture. The old vulture. Yeah, oh, it, you know, there was a, a Merlin was like that. Yeah. Well, this had a, another bank underneath. It was a fantastic engine, and it ran at terribly high RPM. I didn't like it. It idled at about um, 1,800 RPM. Anyway, he fired it up. I got strapped in, and he said, then, off you go. I said, well, what speed does it fly at? He said, oh, go and fly it. He said, you will find out all about it. And you know, that was the only briefing I had on this. So I closed the hood. And I called the tower, and uh, I knew I ought to have a bit of flap for takeoff, so I, I eventually found the flap lever. And I flew it, and it went like the clappers. So I had a great time on that. I got down about half past ten, went back into the office, and he said, Now, have you flown a Vampire 5? I said, No, I've only flown the 3 or something. He said, Well, this isn't much cop, but he said, Come and fly it. I said, What now? He said, Yeah. So I went off in a Vampire 5, and did about an... You can't do long on those aeroplanes. They don't carry much fuel. Did about 45 minutes. When I came back, we went over to lunch. We came back from lunch. And he said, now I want you to fly the Hastings. He said, what have you flown before in big aeroplanes? I said, Lankin, Lincoln. He said, oh, well, that's all right. He said, you'll cope with the Hastings. So 
I climbed up into this Hastings. He showed me a few of the knobs and tits, and then it, then he pushed off. And there was um there was a flight sergeant engineer, and he was facing aft because the the engineer station on Hastings looked aft, and he looked at me and I looked at him, and I said, "Can you work all those knobs and tits?" He said, "Yeah," and he said, "Can you handle that bit over there?" I said, "Well, we're going to find out." So I put all my straps on, taxied out. There was a strong wind at Hallington that day, and I was on a short runway. So we took off and we flew around. And of course it just flew like any other aeroplane really. It was very heavy, the Hastings. And we came into land, and I must say, it, it was a hopeless landing. I held off too high and dropped it, and it bounced. And do you know, it bounced so hard that my chin hit the control column. I was like this, and it went pow, and I went down at my chin. So it bounced back into the air. And of course there's only one salvation for that, that's to open the throttle. And we went round, and I said, I'm sorry about that. He said, oh, don't worry. He said, that wasn't as bad as some. He said, was that your first landing in uh, Hastings? I said, yeah. He said, well, look. He said, you've got to pull on the stick much sooner and much harder. And I said, yeah, you're right. So we went around, and we did another one. And I fiddled it down a bit more gently. I closed the throttle slowly and pulled, and we made quite a nice landing. But it was a pig of an airplane. It was still, it still had a tailwind, you see. It hadn't got onto a nose wheel yet. I did what I always do. I don't like to walk away from a, a bad landing because it's a poor show to finish on a low note. You ought to finish on a high note. So I did, I spent the rest of the afternoon doing circuits. And by the time the end of the day came, we had done about half a dozen good landings. But you see, the next four years, I had all what now people regard as the classic aeroplane, the Sea Fury 10, which was a, a marvellous aeroplane. Uh, we had a Sea Mosquito 33, which was quite good really. It had a long glass house on it for photographic work and towing targets, but it went well. And then, of course, my favourite aeroplane of all, the, the Sea Hornet. I couldn't believe my luck that I was in the Navy long enough to fly that, because by this time I was on a four-year extended commission which I had to agree to in order to do the Empire Test Pilot course. They wouldn't let you do ETPS and then leave the Navy the next day, because that wouldn't be fair. And this Sea Hornet, I loved it. It went like mad. But then you see, Hakim Fryer being so generous to me, um, he got me to fly all the RAF aeroplanes as well. Now, some of them weren't very good. There was a Wellington 10 with electric props, which wandered all over the runway on takeoff. It was a dreadful thing. There was a Bowfighter 10 with Merlins instead of Bristol engines, which was okay, except you, you hoped you didn't get an engine failure on takeoff because it, it wouldn't have survived that. And then um, I had the, the, the remaining sea fires. Well, can I just interrupt you here? Yeah. Because I've heard this about the Bowfighter, that if you lost an engine. But then the engines were relatively close in. You yes, but the fin, the fin and engine. the rudder clearly weren't adequate. Ah. And if you lost an engine at low speed, either on the ground or after takeoff, the only salvation was instantly to close the other throttle, keep it straight and land straight ahead. But I flew the, the last of the sea fires, which was the 45, 46 and 47. Now the 47 had, ha, had a contra-replating prop. It had blades all over the place. I think they were two, three bladed props. And that went like mad, a super aeroplane. The RAF had the equivalent. They had um, Spitfire 22, 23 and 24. But, and that the Spit 24 was the last of the Spits. But they didn't put contra props on it. They didn't need to because they could afford to let it swing on takeoff, you see. Whereas the Navy had to have aeroplanes that ran straight for takeoff on a carrier. Now, Bill Straker was in the handling squad at that time. He was my best man at my wedding. He was very fond of his Spit, 25, uh, Spit 24. I was doing the Sea Fury 10, and he said, oh, my aeroplane will see your aeroplane off any time. I said, no, it won't. I said, my Sea Fury is much faster than yours. So one day we went up to our 15,000 feet in line abreast at about 200 knots, and at the given signal, we both opened the throttles fully. The Sea Fury walked away from the spit. It left him absolutely struggling. 
And after about two minutes, when I turned round, he was nowhere in sight. Now, he had a single prop and you had Contras, is that right? Yes, it did. But I had much more horsepower yeah. in the Sea Fury. Mm. It was a very hairy-chested, good aeroplane. And the other thing I liked about the Sea Fury, the propeller pitch lever and the throttle were connected. You only had one throttle. And if you selected full power, you got 2700 RPM. If you came back to climb power, you got 2400 RPM. If you came back a bit further, you got 2250. So that you never had to fiddle the prop separately. It was always where you wanted it to be. A great aeroplane. Can I just take you back to the Sea Hornet at, at the moment? You mentioned it was it, it had a superb power to weight ratio. Yeah. Um, the props were, were, were handed so that you got no swing or yes. take off. Um, what about aerodynamic limitations? Did you explore those? Well, we, we could go to what is known as VD, which is the maximum demonstrated dive speed, which for that, I don't remember the deed, it was something like 450 knots, which is moving for those days. Of course, we are all used to things much faster now, but uh, that was cracking on. Did you get any compressibility problems? No. 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 And, and of course, the other thing, which now I find strange, there was never a marked limit uh, a Mark number limit on those aeroplanes because Mark numbers were, were only just being investigated then. There was some chap who did a lot of experimental work on Spitfires out of Boscombe Down. But you could fly the Sea Hornet, Mosquitoes, Spits, right up to 40, 45,000 feet and within reason dive them and muck about with them without running into Mark number problems. Well, there was this guy, Martindale, who got, got a spit down to about Mach 9 too, didn't Yes, that's, I think that was the guy I was thinking of. Yeah. Yes. But to get that, he had to do a vertical dive from about 48. How the machine ever survived that, I In don't know. In front of his engine broke off, didn't it? Yes, yeah. Because I gather that the, the later Mark spits had much better uh, Mark crits than, than the Meteor and the Vampire, their wing section. Or they would have done, yes. Mm. But you see... The only thing I remember about high speed on a spit and a sea fire is that they suffered from what it was called aileron reversal. If you did a very high speed dive and you applied the aileron, the aeroplane rolled the wrong way. And the reason it rolled the wrong way was because the ailerons very happily went to deflect the aeroplane that you wanted to go, but it put, they put such a big twist on the wing that the wing twist cancelled the aileron effect and the machine rolled the wrong way. And the, the best way out of that problem was to use a whisker of rudder. If you were in a high speed, a very high speed dive and you wanted to roll to the right, you just gave it a touch of right rudder. Leave the stick alone, give it a poke of right rudder and it would go around like a bird. And of course the moment the speed came off, then you were back to ordinary control. Mm -hmm. So the aileron's were really acting like spring traps then, weren't they? In relation to the wing. Yes, they were. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. And of course, you see, the early Spits and Sea Fires had fabric ailerons, and they were no good. Um, they they would be, they would bend and deflect too much at high speed. So the later ones all had metal ailerons. Anyway, the Handling Squadron was a jolly good uh, uh, time for me for four years in flying all these later stuff, and it included simple little aeroplanes like Valletta, Devon, the Proctor. There were several. And we, we just flew them all. And then we had long meetings with MOD trying to get the finders notes all straight. So that was a happy time. And then, of course, the kind of work you were doing at Handling Squadron really sort of um, indicated the way to your later work with the ARB. In the well, yes, it did. You see, when I came to the end of my four years, I wrote to ETPS and said, I'll be out in three months. I'm looking for a job. Some guy, I can't remember his name, he was a nice book, he wrote back and said there are two appointments going. One is at Hawker's for work on the what will be the hunter, and one is, is with a thing called the ARB, which is the Certification of Civil Transport Aeroplane. And that attracted me more than the work on a hunter, or I think it was called the P1127, wasn't it, or something in its early days. No, that was the Kestrel, wasn't it? The, the, the 1067. The hunting oh. Well, whatever. So um, I let that one go, and I applied to ARB, and there were 50 applicants, and I was shortlisted of five, I think, and I had a very worrying interview up in town. It was chaired by Lord Brabazon, and there were all sort of high-powered people on this uh, 
interview board and all I could do was just sit there and answer their questions. 